Welcome to Team Reptile Adventures. We had an opportunity recently to travel to mid-Michigan where we got to explore one of the area rivers there. We were fortunate enough to hook up with Buckley's Mountainside Canoe and Kayak Trips of Mount Pleasant, Michigan. They were generous enough to set us up with all the supplies we would need for our Chippewa River adventure. Today we will be exploring a part of the Chippewa River that runs through parts of the Mount Pleasant area. We have been on this river before and we have noticed that there is a heavy population of map turtles. The staff at Buckley's keeps track of what wildlife is observed by themselves as well as other canoers while on the river. Most people that report turtle sightings to them state they have seen painted turtles or snappers. They have had very few reports of map turtles which is what we saw the most last time we were here. In fact, it was the only species of turtle that we had found on our last adventure on the Chippewa River. Before long we were headed out on the river on our canoes and we started spotting map turtles right away. Our goal on this adventure is to find out if the turtle population in this area of the river is primarily composed of map turtles and more importantly if there is a heavy population of map turtles what factors are helping to contribute to that. As we traveled along we saw even more map turtles than we had the last time we were here. And once again they were the only species of turtles we had spotted so far. The strong similarities between the map turtle and the more common painted turtles do make it easy for us to understand why so many people would be reporting that they were seeing painted turtles when chances are they were probably actually seeing map turtles just as we were. It's also easy for us to see how it would be difficult for people to actually get a good look at these turtles because they are so skittish and they were plopping down in the water from their basking spots just as we would get close. As we traveled further down the river, we kept spotting more map turtles, but we could never get very close before they disappear into the water. I decided to get out of the canoe and explore a little, in hopes that maybe I could get a little bit closer to some of the turtles. As I walked up ahead of the canoes a little bit, Elisa and Ashley had spotted around the corner what they thought was a large female map turtle basking on a log. As I rounded the corner to approach it, I discovered it wasn't a map turtle after all, but instead was something that I would have never expected to find on this river. A lot better than just a good find. Since Ashley and Elisa had made this great discovery, I felt as though they should have the first opportunity to see it up close. They were also having a little trouble controlling their canoe, so I thought as though I could at least help them back across to our canoe. This is a wood turtle. And I am extremely excited about finding this because, for one thing, I had no clue they'd be on this river. Now, wood turtles love rivers. They love moving water. But generally, they're found more north of here. Um, you know, in the past, in years past, they were probably more common on some of the lower <coughs> rivers here. And I've even heard rumors that uh, they're on the, the Flint River, but I've never found them down there. But the, uh, the girls, Ashley and Elisa, just were pointing when I was going after one of the map turtles. There's a million mosquitoes here, by the way. <laughs> um, but uh, when I was going for one of the map turtles over here, the girls were kind of stuck over in a corner there by a tree, and they could see this big turtle sitting on a log over there. And I just assumed, okay, maybe big female map turtle. Even when I'm walking up on it, then I start looking, and I see the orange on it, and the first thing I thought is, you know, the only wood or the only turtle that has orange on it that I know of is a wood turtle. And of course, I'm like, ah, there's not gonna be a wood turtle here. But guess what? It's a wood turtle. And these turtles, we found them up in the Sheboygan area. They're very strong legs and claws. 
because they're, they like to uh, dwell on the land a lot. And so they need to be able to, well, actually this is a male right here. And you can tell it's the male because of the fact that the, the vent is well past the carapace here. Plus the, uh, the plaster in here is quite a bit concave. I mean, it's very obvious that, that it's a male, plus the long nails. It has such long nails. But these powerful limbs, and the way they come out, they come out like that. <laughs> they come out like that, and it makes it easier for them to dwell on the land, rather than more of a swing motion. They're still good swimmers, but those, the reason their arms come out like that is so they can dwell on the land a little bit easier. And it's kind of neat, because they'll actually, sometimes when they're looking for worms in that, because they love to eat worms, They'll kind of thump on the ground, which helps the vibrations will help bring worms up. But this is definitely a male, and you can actually tell about how old these are by counting what is called the annuli. And the annuli are lines that, uh, they're, they're called scoots, that are on the top of the carapace here. And there's lines, and those lines are the annuli. And you can count them on a turtle, on a wood turtle, to find out how old they are. But this one, because it's probably so old, and I'm, I mean, just looking at these lines right here, it's definitely up in the 20s. I mean, I can count easily, I can count over 20 rings, but they're so small and, and smooth and, and getting worn out. Usually, or, uh, wood turtles will have even more lumps on them, on their shell, but these are really getting worn down with age, and that means that the annuli are tougher to count, which means I'm not gonna be able to tell exactly how old it is, but we'll get a nice shot of it in a minute to show how they're, they're so worn down because it's so old. He's really digging those claws into me. He's a little confused. He's probably been picked up before by a human, but he's pretty confused as to why somebody has him up in the air and like this. And uh, he sat, you can tell they're used to people, these turtles on the, on the river here, because he sat right on the log as I walked up, barely moved at all. Now these can be mistaken a lot for Blanding's turtles because Blanding's turtles have, and also snappers, and I'll show you why with that in a minute, but Blanding's turtles have a plaster in the lower shell that also is a, a yellow color like this with the black markings, and they have a bright yellow neck rather than an orange. Didn't mean to tickle you there, buddy. And they'll also have, they can have some yellow coloration or white coloration under their, their legs. So when someone flips these over, a lot of times they think, oh, it's a Blanding's turtle. But a Blanding's turtle has a much higher dome. The other turtle it gets mistaken for, because of the bumps on the back, is a snapping turtle. But a snapping turtle doesn't have this coloration and also doesn't have this much of a plaster because it can't, we've talked about it on previous episodes where the snapping turtle has so much meat exposed on them that they get torn apart by, uh, by animals, especially when they're small, by hawks and things like that. And that's why they spend so much time in the water, trying to get that mosquito away. Where a wood turtle, they dwell on land so much that they have to have a harder shell and they have to be able to pull in more in their shell. Now he still can't pull in like a box turtle can. Can't even pull in as much as a Blanding's turtle in. He doesn't have a hinge right here. This is a solid one piece plaster. There is no hinge that runs across the chest area that would allow that to close, to close his head in and protect it. So he has to rely on biting, which so far he hasn't been real aggressive. Most of the time wood turtles aren't, but if something was attacking him, he would definitely try to get away and probably take a couple snaps at it. And if he could get the claws on it, he could definitely do some damage there because these are good solid claws, strong for tearing apart things when they're eating worms. They'll grab it, which you could demonstrate right now, grab it like that and pull it away with their limbs. They don't have teeth to chew. No turtles have teeth to chew. So they rely on, oh this poor guy, they rely on uh, being able to grab it and use their forelimbs to just tear it apart. That means just raking across my forearm there. Now, I'm going to show the girls because if it wasn't for them, we would have had no clue that it was out here. But an incredible find, and I know these guys, these guys here at Buckley's are going to be very excited to hear about this because they know there's map turtles out here, they know there's painted turtles out here, but I bet they have no idea that there's wood turtles out here and what that means, knowing that this is on uh, one of Michigan's uh, threatened species list. This is a species that has really gone through decline because of loss of habitat, pollutants in the water, a number of different reasons. And to find a wood turtle here on this river is just absolutely incredible. It's fantastic, my favorite word. It's absolutely fantastic. <laughs> I made sure that Ashley and Elisa each got a chance to check out this turtle. We are not alone. 
We spent a little time discussing its physical characteristics as well as some of its normal behaviors. This was the first time that Ashley and Elisa had ever seen a wood turtle and they were definitely surprised at its mild demeanor compared to the many other turtles they had worked with while doing Team Reptile. It's pretty calm. Yeah. Compared to like the other things that you find on lakes and stuff. Mm -hmm. One of the unusual things that we noticed about this particular turtle was its tail. I just wanted to show the tail on this guy, on the wood turtle. This is his vent right here that I always talk about that comes out, if it's past the carapace, it's a male, generally in turtles. And uh, also the nails often play a factor and so can the plastering on some turtles like the wood turtle. But the tail is, uh, it looks to me, it's, it's possible that it was born a little bit deformed. Uh, generally they won't necessarily come to a point but this one to me looks like it was either born deformed or probably there's a good chance that it lost part of its tail at one time. That's what it really looks like to me that it had a little bit of its tail taken off. Could have been by a fish, another turtle. It, you never know what it was from. But uh, you can see where it kind of patched up and it's it almost looks like it closed, like naturally closed like that. But there's lines where it almost to me looks like it, uh, you know, not that it was operated on, but it's kind of neat the way nature takes care of itself sometimes because it ends up looking like it almost had stitches the way the lines are, the little scars that are there. You can see the annuli that I was talking about generally will stand out. The ridges will be more defined and easier to tell the age but these are so smooth you can't even tell up here anymore and down here the ridges are so close together that chances are and it, it's not specific all the time anyways they won't necessarily grow uh, that way where it's one line annuli per year but it's very close to that and you can get a you can get a real good guessment of how old they are but this guy I mean they can live I don't know exactly how old wood turtles can live. I can't remember what the exact uh, age was of the oldest uh, captive one is, but I know that this one right here is at least 25 years old. I'm sure of that just from this, just from how worn down his shell is. He's been around quite a while. And uh, we're going to leave him on the river. You can't, you can't keep these. Uh, we are really not, we shouldn't even really be handling these. I'm doing it for an educational purpose. Um, they're aware that we were going to do this. I'm going to put them exactly back where I found them. We wouldn't, I would love to keep them for our exhibits and be able to educate people by having a wood turtle and being able to show people back home. But at the same time, because their population numbers are so low, if I took this male that is probably breeding, I hope there's other ones on this river, but uh, if, if this is a breeding male and I don't let it go, then I could myself right now destroy the population of the wood turtle on this river. So by letting it go, I leave it out here so that it can breed. And that's something that you should keep in mind at home. Just like I did when I was a kid, I used to catch turtles and everything, and I would keep them. And luckily it was mostly painted turtles, snapping turtles, things like that, but I didn't know any better. And that's why I wish sometimes that there had been shows and more things in school that educated us about the impact that we have just by catching an animal and taking it. If you take a big snapping turtle out of a pond and it's the only male in there or female in there, you just killed off the population of snapping turtles in that pond. You may have a couple that survive for a while, but you're not going to have any new ones unless more move in. And because the numbers in the state are so low of the wood turtles, by taking this one out of the population right now, I could really seriously have a huge impact on the population of the wood turtles here in this region, but more importantly within Michigan because just like I said, I may, I may destroy populations by taking one turtle out of it. So keep that in mind when you take turtles, things like that, and, and uh, especially you kids at home that do like what I did when I was a kid. So, but we'll let this guy go and we'll be on our way and see if we can find some other neat things. I would highly recommend when you're out here on the Chippewa River you go canoeing rather than walking through the river. Because it turns out walking through the river takes a lot longer than canoeing. Oops, found some rocks. Whoa! Found some big rocks. This is why we're finding so many map turtles. I didn't notice it the last time we were out here, 
but there's all kinds of clams in this river. And in fact, here's a, this is one of the biggest clams I think I've ever seen. <laughs> this thing is huge. But map turtles, especially the big females, love to tear apart clams and eat the, uh, the uh, meat inside there. I don't want to pull this apart. I mean, this is a big clam. I don't want to pull it apart and break it. But there is, uh, it's hard to keep the boat still when we're on the river like this, but there is a lot of meat in this one right here. An awful lot of meat. And the males, the male map turtles will eat a little bit too um, of the clams, but generally they're going to go for the smaller clams. And the big females, they'll go for the smaller and the bigger ones. They'll just tear them apart and break them open. But their jaws, the big female jaws with that wider head and stronger jaws, and plus just the size, they're just a bigger, the females are a lot bigger than the males. They are able to take these and, and break them apart a lot easier than the males. The males have smaller heads, not as strong as a beak, and because of their smaller size, they can't, they can't break open the clams as easy. Another thing I just found on this one, though, that's kind of neat is there's a leech on this one, <laughs> which is kind of unusual because it's probably not able to do much with the shell there. Through the shell, generally when you find leeches, they're on the meat part of something rather than on the outside shell. So it might just be making its way across. Probably doesn't even realize what it's on right now. That's a big clam. That is a big clam. We're being in a river. Boom! <laughs> it shook the ground, it was so big. We're starting to get discouraged. We keep seeing the map turtles. We've counted at least three dozen map turtles, at least, just basking on logs throughout our trip so far. And uh, we, we, every time we get close, to try to catch one so that we can show you folks at home. They scoot off pretty quick. You can tell they're pretty jumpy out here. But we just passed a log where we had seen a few back there, and all of a sudden I glanced over to the right and I asked Amy, I said, is that a baby? And she's like, I think it is. And we got up, and this is just a little hatchling. I mean, this guy has hatched very recently. I'd say he's probably maybe two weeks old at tops. And uh, a very cool little find. And uh, these guys, when they're, when they're young like this, they're so susceptible, or susceptible to being eaten by big fish and bullfrogs and turtles and things like that. So, But I see another boat coming, so we're going to get on our way. As we made our way back to Buckley's, we spotted quite a few more map turtles, but never any painted turtles. This led us to believe that people were mistaking the map turtle for painted turtles. There probably are painted turtles on this river, although this is twice we've been out here and not seen a single one. But if they do live on this river, they're probably further down where it's slower moving and there is more aquatic vegetation. When we arrived at Buckley's, they were excited to hear that we had found a wood turtle on the river. When we showed them pictures, they said that they had actually seen some on the river before, which is a real good sign for the wood turtle population. We then showed them pictures and video of some of the many map turtles we had seen along the river. Our discussion from that point helped confirm that many people, including staff members, had been mistaking the map turtles for painted turtles. We explained to them some of the major differences between the two species that help make identifying each species easier. Painted turtles generally have a green, olive or dark gray carapace which is the back or upper part of the shell. The scutes or scales on the carapace are sometimes outlined in red but not always. The map turtle on the other hand usually has a bronze or tan shell which usually has lots of red squiggly lines that look like rivers and roads on it which is how they got their name. The bottom portion of the shell called the plastron is also different between the two turtles. The painted turtle's plastron is usually a yellow, tan, or cream color and often has something that looks like an ink blot in the middle. When looking at the bottom of a painted turtle, the bottom edge of the carapace is generally red or orange with black and squiggly lines that outline it. The plastron of a map turtle is usually yellow or tan, but it should not have an ink blot in the middle. More importantly, the coloration on the bottom edges of the carapace will be yellow with gray or black rather than the red of the painters. Another difference between the painted turtle and the map turtle is the mouth coloration. The painted turtle's mouth is usually a clear or white with a yellow outline, while the map turtle's mouth is often more of a flesh tone and does not generally have an outline. 
One of the most important differences in physical characteristics between the two species has to do with the coloration on their head and limbs. The painted turtle's head and neck have red and yellow markings on them, while their legs and tail only have red markings on those. The map turtle, on the other hand, has only yellow markings on their head, neck, legs, and tail. This is one of the key differences that helps us to determine which species of turtle we are looking at from a distance. After explaining some of the major physical differences as well as habitat between painters and map turtles to the staff at Buckley's, it was time for us to be on our way. This wouldn't be the end of our Chippewa River adventure, however, as we were about to find the most unique creature we have ever had on Team Reptile Adventures. It happened more by chance than anything else. In fact, we didn't even have a camera with us. What you see here was actually taken later on. Amy's parents have a cabin around the Mount Pleasant area, and while Amy and her mom were shopping in Mount Pleasant, Amy's dad and I went to check out a couple hidden fishing ponds that him and his buddy had been to before. As we walked around the edge of one of the ponds, my father-in-law noticed a couple of frogs. Of course, I can't let a couple of frogs just hop around without me at least checking them out, so I walked over to take a look. The first little one I caught was missing part of a back leg, while the second one I caught was fine. I told my father-in-law that the one had probably lost part of its leg from a predator, or maybe it was just born that way. Then I found a second frog missing part of its back leg, and now I was starting to suspect something. The fourth frog I caught was fine, but the fifth one we found confirmed what I had suspected. The fifth little leopard frog that I had found had a little something extra on it. This little something extra on the frog was actually an extra appendage. From the elbow of the front right limb, there were two complete forearms with fingers. What we noticed while studying this little frog was that it could actually move both forearm regions of the leg independently. Although this sounds great, it actually seemed to cause more problems for this frog as it tried to move about. My father-in-law and I had captured one more leopard frog before we left the pond for that day. Out of the six leopard frogs that we now had, three had physical abnormalities. Two were missing parts of their hind legs, while one had an extra leg. Now I had mentioned earlier that I suspected something after we had found the first two frogs with parts of their limbs missing. When I found the frog with the extra limb, that confirmed what I was thinking. What I had suspected was that these frogs had mutations that caused their abnormalities. Mutations are sudden physical or chemical changes in the genetic makeup of an organism. Now the little five-legged frog obviously had a change in the normal genetic physical makeup of it. There is usually some sort of circumstance or combination of circumstances that will cause mutations. After looking closely at our five-legged little friend, I was pretty confident that Dr. Xavier and the X-Men had nothing to do with it. It was probably caused by some environmental factors. Scientists have found that most mutations, at least in frogs, seem to be linked to environmental stress. Leopard frogs suffered a tremendous decline in numbers over the last 30-some years. I remember as a kid seeing them everywhere. Now their population is much lower and they are struggling to survive in regions where they had been the most abundant frog species years ago. Much of the reason for the decline in numbers and probably mutations can be blamed on pollution, fertilizers, pesticides, disease, and also loss of habitat. All of these factors cause stress. Think of how we as people react to stress. Well, the leopard frog didn't seem to handle it very well and for a while they were really dying off. Although mutations are nothing new, there does seem to be an increase in the number of frogs found with them. Perhaps in the northern leopard frog's attempt to survive and increase its numbers, their bodies are just trying to adapt as quickly as possible, which could be a cause of some of the mutations. Of course, we were very curious to know if there were more mutated leopard frogs back at that pond in the Mount Pleasant area. We weren't able to get back up to the pond until about a month after we had found the first mutated leopard frogs. It seemed very unlikely that we had discovered the only mutated leopard frogs of the entire pond in the 20 minutes or so my father-in-law and I had spent there before. This time, Amy, her parents, and myself all went to the pond to check it out. It is such a beautiful pond and so secluded that it was so hard for me to imagine that it could possibly be this pond that is causing the mutations. Come to find out, this pond is fed by the Chippewa River, so there could be more to the situation that's causing the mutations. We searched the same area where we had found the mutated frogs before, and although we were not having any trouble finding juvenile leopard frogs, we weren't finding any with any abnormalities.
Hind legs look normal. Oops. Everything looks normal in this little guy. One of the very last frogs that I found quickly caught my interest. Looks like he's fine too. Should be watching the face and everything though, make sure there's no... There appeared to be something unusual with one of its hind feet. After closer examination, I realized part of its toe was missing, which could have simply been caused naturally. <laughs> I got a buck hit me. Where was he? Maybe not. Look like, oh yeah, right there, but that could just be an injury. That toe right there. In between the two longer ones. His longest one right there is missing, but it almost looks like it was broken off rather than a mutation. Right in there. Everything else on them looks normal. He's glowing. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that would be funny. We didn't find any more mutated leopard frogs on this adventure, but we do have a full-scale team reptile excursion planned for next summer to check out this area in search of mutated leopard frogs, as well as other area wildlife. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time on Team Reptile Adventures. <laughs>